Good morning, and once again, we're glad that you can join us by this means. Um, it's not the way we would prefer to do it, but we're glad that you can join us this morning or whenever you're able to watch the service. Uh, perhaps you've seen on the, the news or on the internet churches that are putting pictures of their congregation uh, taped to the, to the pews and to the chairs. And I know how and I would say we don't necessarily need pictures. We know where you're sitting and we miss you being in those spots, whether it's all those back row Baptists in the three sections or whether it's all our students here at the front. Uh, but we're glad that you can join us in this capacity. So we're glad that you're with us to worship today. Uh, I read a, a meme recently that said, the church isn't closed, it's deployed. And I think in the fight that we're in right now, we are deployed to minister to the people around us, to our families, uh, to our neighbors, to be able to spread the love and the kindness and the grace of our Lord and Savior to the people around us. So let's pray as we begin our time of worship. Father, we thank you for a, a beautiful day today. We thank you for the opportunity we have to, to worship uh, in this way. Uh, Lord, again, it's not the way we would prefer, but Lord, you work in amazing ways through technology and through other means, and we thank you for the way that we can be able to, to look at your word, uh, to proclaim your word, uh, even in this setting. Lord, thank you for the, the love and the grace and the kindness you have shown to us. Uh, Lord, may we do that in the fight that we're in right now to the people around us. We continue to pray for our first responders, and we pray for those doctors and nurses and those in the healthcare profession that are taking care of so many people. We pray that you will keep them safe, that you will continue to work through them. And Lord, again, we thank you for your presence here with us today. Uh, bless how as he brings your word today, and may we be sensitive to what it needs to say to us. And Lord, may we go out and, and be your, your agents of the gospel in all that we do this week. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Tom. I know that I mentioned this last week that I never get used to uh, preaching to a sanctuary that doesn't have basically anybody in it. Lisa and Mo are the only ones that are that are here right now, and and I'm glad of that. I'm glad I don't get used to it. And one thing that I miss so much is the worship before I preach. I have said many times uh, to our church when we were gathered together that. That that time of worship is so important for me um, to just kind of zero in on the Lord and prepare my own heart and, and ready myself for that. And so to, to come to a place and just to have to jump right in and start preaching is, is, is a lot different for me. But I'm still thankful for the opportunity uh, to be able to talk about the Word of God and what God is saying to us. Well, I want you to turn your Bibles, if you will, uh, to 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and 7, and we will get there in just a minute. I read in Acts chapter 1 where Jesus had gathered his disciples together, and this was 40 days after his resurrection, and it was just moments before his ascension. And so he gathered his disciples all around him, and, um, and they asked him a question. They said to him, they said, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now, my focus isn't on the content of what their question was. My focus is on the fact that they had questions. And I'm sure that one question uh, that they asked was not the only question in their heart and minds. And I really believe that what is behind that question is actually 
they're wanting to know what's going on. And I realized that they've, they had been with him for 40 days, had seen him, had talked with him, had shared meals together with him, had spent that time together, and yet they're still wondering what's happening, what is, what is ultimately going to take place. And now he gathers them together, and he is actually, literally, going to be taken up right out of their sight, right out of their midst. And so behind their question about the kingdom, behind it was simply, Lord, what's going on? Help us understand uh, what is happening. And I don't think that that's any different than, than what we're facing and what we're going through in our present circumstance. This, this pandemic, as it's being called, uh, that we are experiencing in our day and time is something that is creating an incredible amount of questions. And we are, we are asking them, and some of them are being asked, and some of them maybe are just, just being harbored in your own heart. I know for me personally that for the last few weeks, uh, there have been some questions that, that I can't get out of my mind. Uh, questions I believe that God has, has prompted me to think about, and not just think about, but to really begin to, to search His Word and to actually see what, what He may have to, to say about that. And so what I want to do today is, is I want to... I want to bring those questions out of my mind and my heart, and I want to share those questions with you, but not just ask the questions. I want to tell you what my answers are to them, which is really risky um, because, it, 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 well, it's just risky, and you'll see as we walk through it. But at the same time, I believe that there are questions that maybe many people are asking. And so I, what I want to do is to be able to just look at them. I want to tell you what my answers are, and then I want to take you to some of these passages in the Word of God, and I want to help you to see the reasons that I have for the way that I, that I answer them. So let me begin by just telling you what, what my questions are. My first question is this. I have been asked by a variety of people, not a lot, but a few people in the last, since this all started. I have been asked by people if I thought that this pandemic was the judgment of God on our world because of the world's sinfulness and the world's ungodliness. Well, my question, as I think about that, my question in reply to that is this, what if, what if this pandemic is not just an unfortunate circumstance that has taken place around the world, but what if it actually is an act of God, something that God is doing, and that God's not just working in, but that God is doing, but it is not just, it is not an act of judgment on the world. What if, what if it is actually an act of judgment of God against His church, on His church? What if God, in some way, is judging us as the church, the global church, for the sin and the ungodliness in our lives? What if? What if that is actually what it is? My second question is this, and it's related to the fact that, that most of the churches, at least in America, that most of the churches are not able to gather together. In fact, almost any Sunday, with the exception of churches that may be doing a drive-in type service where they're gathered in their cars, a few churches have decided to still gather together. But in a lot of ways, most of the time, our churches are empty. And they're empty because the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, has said it's in our best interest if we don't gather together in order that we might slow the spread of this virus. And I'm, I support that. I think that's a I think that's a great idea. But what if, what if behind that is that our churches are empty not because of what the CDC is saying, but what if our churches are empty because God is prohibiting us from gathering together in our churches basically because He is sick and tired of us just playing church He's tired of the fact that, that in our churches there is so much. In church, and I'm talking about the church globally. Not just my own church, but the church globally. There's so much 
playing church. There's so much division. There's so much prejudice. There's immorality. There's idolatry. There are so many things. We are, we are rebelliously disobedient in so many ways. We are, we are characterized by more so by the ways of the world than we are the ways of God. And what if God has said, you know what? I'm just sick and tired of it. What if God said, I am so sick of it, I could literally vomit you out of my mouth. And that's scriptural. I'll show you in just a moment. But what if God was at that place where he just said, no more, I've had enough. And he, not the CDC, but he is the one who closed the doors. What if? My third question is this, and I am so thankful for the health care workers and everything that they are doing to take care of the sick and the hurting and the dying. And I'm thankful for what they and the CDC and others are doing in order to try to find a vaccine for this virus, for this pandemic. And I hope that they do. I pray that they do. But my question is, what if the cure for this pandemic is not coming from the CDC, but what if the cure is going to come from God only as His church humbles themselves and prays and seeks His face and turns from their wicked ways? In fact, let me even let me rephrase that. Let me restate, restate that. What if the cure will only come from God as we, the church, humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. And then, and only then, will God do what he has promised to do, and that is that he will hear from heaven, he will forgive our sin, and he will heal our land. Now I realize some of you may be thinking how you have lost your mind. You've been quarantined for too long. What you are saying, Hal, is so far-fetched. But my question is, what if I'm not off base? What if it really is that God is in some way bringing judgment upon His church in order that they repent and return to Him? What if God has closed the doors of our churches in a temporary fashion and said, no more? Get your hearts right before you come together and worship again. What if God is saying, I want to bring healing to this world, but it will only come about as my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. What if our present situation isn't just an unfortunate set of circumstances what if it actually is something that God is doing in an effort to get our, the global church, to get our attention that we might genuinely turn our hearts and our minds back to God? If I'm honest with you, I have to say that I actually believe that it really is, that really is the case. So, so why would I say that? What, what would the reasons be that I would answer my questions in that manner? Well, let me give you a couple of reasons that I find from Scripture. One is that there is a precedent for what I have just described. There is precedent for God to act in a way to bring judgment upon His people, to close the doors of their temple and their houses of worship, and then, as they repent, for God to bring healing to their land, there is precedent to that. In fact, look at 2 Chronicles chapter, uh, seven, chapter 7 and beginning in verse 13. The Lord said, If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then 
God says, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And so what you have right there is everything that I have just described in my questions and how I see answered. And what I'm saying based on this passage and the larger part of it in chapter 6 that I will show you in just a moment that what you have is, you have the precedent. In other words, God's done it before. It's happened before. In fact, not only in the situation that's being described that Solomon is talking about in chapter 6 and 7 of 2 Chronicles, but if if you think back, just to highlight some of Israel's history, if you think back to the period of the judges, what was characteristic of those of the people of God during those years was that every one, I'm talking about the people of God, every one did what was right in their own eyes. Not what was right in God's eyes, but what was right in their own eyes. And when you read through the book of Judges, what you find is a repetition of accounts where the people of God do their own thing, go their own way, are sinful and disobedient to God. And what God does in response to their sin is that God brings judgment upon them. And specifically, for the most part in the book of Judges, it is another nation that comes in and takes them captive. And they are under the hand of that enemy until they repent. And when they turn from their sin and they repent, what God does is that God hears and responds and God raises up a judge who comes and acts as a deliverer for them and delivers them from the hand and the nation of Israel enjoys peace until such time as that judge dies and they go right back into the place where they once were. It is the precedent in Scripture that the people of God have acted this way and have responded this way with regard to God. Not only in those settings, in the book of Judges, but as you begin to read through 1st and 2nd Samuel and the Kings and and then the recording of history in the book of Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, the words of the prophets, what you find is, is you find that when the nation of Israel split and was divided into two separate kingdoms, the ten tribes to the north, what happened to them was they began to be characterized by idolatry and immorality and prejudice and all the kinds of things in their disobedience to God. And God warned them through the prophets. God spoke to them over and again to change their ways, to repent of their sin and to return to Him. And they turned a deaf ear to God. And what God did was, ultimately, ultimately, the Assyrians came in, overthrew them, and those ten tribes are lost. You can't, they're not even a part of, of, of that part of the people of God even to this day. Why? Because God was judging His people for their rebellion and their sin. And because they did not repent, they did not experience God bringing healing to their land. And then you look at the southern kingdom... The other tribe, the tribe mainly of Judah, and when you look at the southern kingdom and, and what was characteristic of them was basically the same thing. In fact, in fact, after the northern kingdom was destroyed, God repeatedly warned the southern kingdom, his people, and he would say to them, look at what happened to your sister. Look at how they rebelled. Look at how they sinned. Look at the judgment that came upon them and their refusal to respond to me. And look where they are now. And he warned them over and over again. Again, they too turned, for the most part, turned the deaf ear to God. Now I realize, I realize that within the people of God, there were, there were members of the people of God whose heart was holy God, who were following him. In fact, you just think about in the, in the southern kingdom before Jerusalem and the people of God were taken by Babylonia into captivity, what you find is you've got men like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, you have Ezekiel. And you have all of these individuals whose heart is fully God's and following him. And yet they themselves, because the, the overarching of the people of God was rebellious to God, what you have is is that they suffer along with all of the people of God because of of where the people of God are. And so God brings judgment upon Jerusalem. Many of the people are deported to Babylon. Jeremiah is left and read his prophecy and read what God said through him. Jeremiah is left in a city where the walls have been broken down and the temple has utterly been destroyed. 
And God is speaking to them. But what you see in that is that you see God, you see God working in a way through the disaster and the difficulties and the foreign enemy that came in and overtook them. And it was because of their sin. And God is speaking to them judgment. And to me, it is a great example and an illustration to us as the church today to allow the circumstances that we see going on around us at least ask God. Lord, are you saying something to us? Lord, is it just an unfortunate circumstance that's happening around the world? Or Lord, is it actually you putting your hand of judgment upon your church to get our attention so that we turn our hearts back to you? You say, well, how that's all Old Testament stuff. That's everything that God said in the Old Testament. Is there anything in the New Testament? Absolutely there is. You turn to the book of Revelation, and I know I I see a few things on Facebook of people talking about, oh, we're in the end times, and I I don't know whether that's true or not. It's end times alike, but it's not chapter 4 and following that captures my attention in those catastrophic, catastrophic events that will take place in the Great Tribulation. What captures my attention is in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation where Jesus spoke messages to seven literal churches of, his, of, his, of John's day and time. And they are not only messages to the church then, they are applicable to the church today. And listen to what he said to, to them. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5, he told them that they had left their first love and if they did not change and if they did not repent and return to God, then what he said was in Revelation 2 and verse 5, he said, if you do not repent, I'm going to take your lampstand out. We learn in chapter 1 that the lampstand uh, refers to the church. And so God is saying, because of where you are, you have just, you have left your first love. And because of where you are, if something does not change, God says, I will respond to you in a way where I will take your lampstand and I will remove it. And what a word. And then you come to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 16. It's the message to the church at Laodicea. And what God, what Jesus said to the church at Laodicea, He said, I wish you were hot or I wish you were cold, but where you are is lukewarm. And he says, I would just as soon vomit you out of my mouth because of this lukewarm place that you are in your life. He said that to the church. And he warned them as he did all of those seven churches for the most part. There are warnings from God. There are calls to repentance. There are actions of God, of His involvement in the life of those churches where He is bringing His judgment to bear on them. No, it's not ultimate judgment, but it is an act of God to judge His people to the end that they repent and they return to God. You say, you say, Hal, do you really believe that God could shut the doors of our church? That God could say, no, no more gathering." Until there's a change in your heart and you're not playing church, no more gathering. Well, absolutely there is. Let me show you this. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah, who is living in that time when the people of God are taken captive and the walls in the city has been destroyed and the temple. Listen to what the Lord said uh, to and through Jeremiah. Jeremiah 7 verse 1. It says, the word word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah, who enter by the gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, then... I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Man, doesn't that sound exactly like what Solomon had said years before? When he had said, God, if these things happen, 
If we repent, will you not in turn hear, forgive, and heal our land? And the Lord through Jeremiah is saying to them on the verge of being taken captive, he's saying to them, amend your ways, repent of your sin. And if you do, God says, I will let you dwell in this place. Look at verse 8. He says, behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Listen to this. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, offer sacrifices to Baal, walk after other gods that you have not known, then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered, that you may do all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, declares the Lord. Let me stop there and say this. If, if you read in the Gospels during the last part of Jesus, the last week of Jesus' life, when he went into the temple and cleansed it, he said, you have made the house of God a den of robbers. He was making reference to this passage. In, the, in Israel, in Jesus' day, the place that should have been the worship of God, a place of worship and prayer had been turned into a den of robbers. And no doubt they were doing these very things that he says here. He says, has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, declares the Lord. But go now to my place, which is in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at the first, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these things, declares the Lord, and I spoke to you, rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear. I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house which is called by my name, in which you trust, and to the place which I gave you and your fathers to dwell, as I did to Shiloh. I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all of your brothers, all the offspring of Ephraim. And those are strong words. And you know what goes through my mind as I read that and I consider, consider all of this? I mean, I, I, I'm human. I, am, I have a fear about this virus. And, and you can say it's a lack of faith or whatever. I, I'm concerned about that in our culture, in our world today. But what grips my heart the most is that I would have a greater fear of a virus than a greater fear of God who is saying these words that I've just read to you. Could God judge his people for their sin, their complacency, their compromise of truth, their idolatry, their immorality, their prejudice, their wickedness, their ways of the world? Just like what he described in, I, in Jeremiah, that we go out, we live what we want to, we do what we want to, we live in all of those kinds of ways that he described, and then we come and we sit on a pew, and we say we worship God. God, who alone knows our heart, sees past all of, the, all of the outward looks. And he looks into our hearts, and I just firmly believe it is possible. I believe it to be so. It's not the CDC that has closed our doors. It is God saying, get your heart right with me, because I'm sick of the worship as it is. And I say that humbly. It may not have come across that way, but I say that humbly, because I'm, I'm including myself in this, I'm standing here including myself in everything that I have just said. Me examining my own heart so that I may repent and turn to God and experience that cleansing that only God can give. And you may be thinking, well, why doesn't God just say repent? Why doesn't God just tell us to get it right and repent? Why all of the pain and suffering? Why is that necessary? Well, I'll tell you why it's necessary. Because God has said repent over and over and over again. And just like his people, as I read in Jeremiah, just like his people, the response has been that we've turned a deaf ear to God. You know, in fact, what we've done? God says repent 
And what we do is we double down on our religious activity in an effort to placate God. And what God wants more than anything is not religious activity. He said it numerous times in the Bible. He doesn't want religious activity. What He wants is repentance. For we turn our hearts and our, turn our minds back to the Lord. Well, there's precedent for it. There is example again and again in the Bible, Old and New Testament. But it's not only the precedent of it, there is a prophetic word about it. And what I'm referring to is, is more so what God has said within His Word. I really believe that Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5, where Jesus said to the church at Ephesus, you have left your first love. And if you do not, if you do not remember from where you have fallen and repent and, re and begin to do again the works that you did at first, I really believe when God says, if you don't do that, then I'm going to move your, remove your candlestick, your lampstand from where it is. I take that as a prophetic word from God that if we wander in our love for God, if we are no longer, He is no longer our first love, then we need to hear that as a warning from God that our hearts need to change. That if we do not repent, if we do not change, then God says, this is what's going to happen. I believe that Revelation chapter 3 and verse 16 is a prophetic word to the church of Laodicea. Some would read those, those churches of, of the Revelation as being periods of church history and would say that right now we're in the Laodicean age. <clears throat> An age in which we are lukewarm instead of hot and on fire and serving God with all of our heart. And I take that word in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 16 where he says, I would just as soon spew you out of my mouth. That ought to be a prophetic word to us, just like the prophets spoke in the Old Testament. And we ought to not respond like His people for the most part did back then, where we just say, oh, okay, and then we turn a deaf ear to it, but rather that it genuinely penetrates our heart. But I also believe that what He said here in the passage that I ask you to turn to in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 13 is also a prophetic word. So, so think with me about what was happening in 2 Chronicles. It's a, it's a, a recounting of, the, of a historical event that took place back in 1 Kings chapter 7 and 8. It was the time when Solomon, under the United Kingdom, he was the son of David who followed David as king, and the nation of Israel was united under him, and he built the temple of God, and in 2 Chronicles 6 and 7, what you have is the nation gathered together to dedicate this awesome temple to God. And in that dedication, Solomon prays. And in chapter 6, what he says repeatedly as he is praying, he said, Lord, this is a place where you have chosen to dwell. And what he says to God is a re repetition of what ifs. God, what if your people do this? And what if in their doing this that you respond by doing this? What if? If that happens, will you then? And so this whole prayer is, is just this offering to God before they're in this condition. And he's crying out to God and saying, God, if this happens, will you do this? Well, the day of dedication ended. They had sacrifices and offerings and celebration. And then Solomon goes home. And beginning in verse 11, let me read. The Solomon finished the house of the Lord. This is 711. And the king's palace and successfully completed all that he had planned to do according, planned on doing in the house of the Lord in his palace. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. And I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And then look at verse 13. God said, If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. Now stop there. Because what I see in that one verse is a prophetic word from God. 
is God saying to His people that there will be times, there could be times, that I, God, will bring such things upon you. My purpose is to get your attention. Yes, it will be bringing judgment upon you. But my purpose is to get your attention in order that you might repent and return to me. And so what you have in this is this prophetic word is, I believe, God saying it should not catch us off guard. It shouldn't be an unusual thought to think, could God actually bring judgment upon His people because of their sinfulness? What you and I ought to do is look at what God says in His Word and say, absolutely it is possible. There's the precedent that He did it, but there's also the prophetic word that He would do it if His people wandered away from Him. Now, so, so how should we respond? I mean, if, if in fact, and I believe it is, if in fact that is what could happen, what may be happening even now in our present circumstance, then what should we do? How should we respond? What should our response be? Well, he tells us, it's a famous verse. It's easy to read. We read it, quote it. We've got it printed. We've got it uh, framed. It's on our walls. We talk about it. You've probably seen it a thousand times on Facebook since this pandemic started. But I want you to listen to what he said. Verse 14, and my people, if my people who are called by my name, not the world, but my people, if they humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Now what he does, and I'm not going to take time today to elaborate on them, but what he does in those four phrases, humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, and turn from our wicked ways, what he does in those four phrases is that he is basically describing what repentance is. In Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, the other passage that I read to you or mentioned to you, in both of those, Jesus said, repent. Well, what does repentance look like? What is repentance? It is humbling ourselves and praying and seeking His face and turning from our wicked ways. Now, as I thought about that, I thought, you know what? Repentance is, it is an attitude of our heart. It's a change of mind. But repentance is also a change of our behavior and our actions. And I would go so far as to say, listen to this, I would go so far to say that if there has not been a change in our action, namely that we have turned from our wicked ways, and that's God's description, not mine. If we have not turned from our wicked ways and returned to following and walking with God in obedience to Him, I would go so far as to say there has been no genuine repentance. We may feel sorry. We may be sad that we have sinned. We may even name it and acknowledge it. But if we come before God and we pour out our heart before Him and then we walk away and we keep doing the same thing, I'm telling you there has been no genuine repentance in your heart. And all we're doing is basically just placating God, trying to with our religious activity. In fact, let me show you something. Nehemiah, <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter 1, and Nehemiah is coming back to Jerusalem at the end of that period that they had been away from God because of his judgment. And in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 8, listen to what Nehemiah, this is a prayer of of confession for, his, for the whole nation to God. In verse 8 he said, he's praying to God, he says, Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though 
Those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heavens. I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. What I want you to see in verse 9 is this. He says, if you return, that's, that's describing repentance. But notice what he associates with repentance in verse 9. Not just return, but you keep my commandments and you do them. And that's why I'm saying that there is an association between repentance, genuine repentance, and actually then following in obedience. There's a connection there. And what I'm saying is that for, genuine, for repentance to be genuine, there must be a turning from sin and an actual following in obedience to what God says. We'll talk more about that in, in the weeks to come. But I just want you to understand that God has said, Here, here's, here's how you respond. In fact, He said, you know what? When you see these things happening, when you realize that there is plague and drought and pestilence and locusts and enemies that have come in and overtaken you. He said that ought to raise your antennas to understand spiritually that I, God, am doing something in your midst. And your response ought to be to repent, to turn to me, to humble yourself, to break your pride, to pray, confess your sin before me. To seek my face, my favor, God says, again. And put away, turn away from your wicked ways. And then listen to what God said in response. In verse 14, 2 Chronicles 7. He says, then, then. And I would say then and only then. God says, I will hear And what's running through my mind right now is, God, what have you been doing up to this point? And I can think of numbers of verses of Scripture that says, if you regard iniquity in your heart, God says, I will not hear. And maybe it is, well, it's just an incredible thought to realize that God says, when you repent, then I will hear. I will forgive your sin. And then he said, I will heal your land. That's why I say, and, and you know what, what I'm thinking? Man, what if, what if the church globally took to heart the word of God and what he says, the acknowledge that this is possible, this is what's happening, and the church globally repented. I don't think we would see a wave of healing. Wouldn't it be amazing if the church globally repented and then God, in an awesome act of God, that He brought healing across this land? <laughs> that would be something that ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox, nobody could explain. In fact, there'd be only one reason, one way to explain it, that God did it. To what end? Why is all this so important? Well, in, in the text, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 6 and 7, in the text... God says, I'm doing all of this, all of this to happen. As Solomon is praying, he said, to the end that all the peoples of the earth may know that you are God. It's in verse 33. I was looking for it. He says, then hear from heaven, from your dwelling place, chapter 6, 33, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel and that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. In other words, in other words what he's saying is, God, do all of this. 
as you bring judgment and we respond to you in repentance and you hear and forgive and heal our land, then God, as you respond, you do it in order that all the peoples of the earth might know that you are God. Listen, as much as I want God, as much as I want God to get rid of this pandemic, I want God to do it in a way so that all the peoples of the earth will know that he is God. And what I'm saying is, you know when that will happen? You know how that will happen? It will happen as the church acknowledges their sin before God in repentance, humbles themselves, prays, and seeks His face, and turns from their wicked ways. Then God heals. God forgives. God hears, forgives, heals. To the end of that, all the peoples of the earth may know that He is God. Now you, may, you may say, Man, Hal, I don't know if I like this picture of God that you've painted this morning. I do not want to think about God as a God who could, who would bring that kind of judgment upon His people. Well, I want to remind you of something that Jeremiah said in, Jeremiah cha- in um, Lamentations chapter 3. It's that famous passage that talks about His compassions fail not. His mercies are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. But but the NIV translation of that translates a portion of it in this manner. The very beginning translates it this way. He says this. It's translated this way. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. Your steadfast love never fails. Your compassions never fail. They do not fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And what I'm saying to you, yes, do I believe God could put His hand heavy upon His church to humble us to the place where we repent and turn to Him that God, that we could be the church genuinely, be the church that God has really created and called us and wants us to be? Yes, I believe God can, will, is doing that. But I want to remind you that even in the midst of all of that, it is of His mercy that we are not consumed. It is only because of God's mercy. He is not giving us what we do deserve. But that He has been patient with us as a church. But I'm saying that as the church, we must now, we must now respond to God in repentance, just like He says so that God can do what God has promised and bring healing. Why? So that all the earth can know that there is a God, that the Lord, that He Himself is God. And just imagine what could happen if, because what will happen globally will only happen as each nation responds. And the only way a nation is going to respond to God is that the local church is responding. And the only way the local church is going to respond is that you and me, is in our heart before God, we humble ourselves and pray and seek His face, calling on Him to keep His promise that if we did, that He would respond by hearing, forgiving, and healing us. Lord, may it be so. May you help us hear and may we respond in obedience. Let's pray together. Father, I I just want to pray right now that for the church, your church, globally. Lord, in so many ways, we we are divided by denomination. We are divided by race. We are divided by our own our own beliefs our differences. I pray, Father, that we humble ourselves. Lord, in so many ways in your church, there is idolatry. Lord, there is immorality. There is prejudice. There is the twisting of truth. There is the compromise of truth in your word. There's greed. There's hatred. There's partiality. Lord, may we be humble before you. Lord, help us 
confess our sin to you. Help us call on your name. If we, if we call ourselves the body of Christ, may we genuinely realize what you're doing, God. And Father, may we respond to you in humbling ourselves and repenting of our sin that you, Lord, may hear from heaven, forgive our sin, and heal our land. God, help us do that. And I pray that you take this word, your word, and God, wherever it needs to go, through the, the means of the internet and all of that, I pray you take your word, God. And I pray your church, your church globally, hears what you are saying and that, God, we would see the church humbling ourselves, praying, seeking your face, turning from our sin that you might hear, forgive, and heal. May it be so, Lord Jesus. In his name we pray.